Hello, hi. So we're talking about linear independence today. Last time we did the first time, first linear independence part, and this is the second linear independence part. So the exercise, the check-in exercise that we're looking at is a straightforward linear independence problem. One thing a person might notice is that it says, uh, show that the first is linearly dependent, and a person might say to themselves, ah, so I need to think out exactly what combination of one, two, three, what, what adds to, ah, so a person might say, I notice that if you take the first one and then you double the, uh, very true, very true. If you happen to notice exactly what the dependence is, well, that's, that's great, good for you. Nobody made seeing the answer a, a crime. But I'm going to go through, when I do this problem, I'm going to go through and, and produce how you would solve the problem in general because for, for those times when you're stuck you don't see quite what to do it doesn't do any good to have seen a couple of clever answers and then be called upon to be clever at least it doesn't do me any good okay so I'm looking to uh, show that um, that that the first set is linearly dependent so I'm looking to say something like uh, C1 times uh, uh, 130 plus C2 times 1, 2, 0 plus C3 times 1 minus 1, 0 is equal to 0, 0, 0 and I expect to find more than just a trivial solution I expect to find that there's some C1 and C2 and C3 that, that, that are not all three of them 0 that make this equation true so, of course, I'm going to answer this question the way I answer so many other questions in here is I'm simply going to do Gauss's method. So here we go. I get uh, C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 0 by looking at the top line. Then I get 3C1 plus 2C2 minus C3 equals 0. And the bottom line is 0 equals 0. If you do minus 3 row 1 plus row 2, then uh, you get C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 0 and then the next line is minus C2 minus 4C3 equals 0 and the 0 equals 0 line is, again, is not very interesting. Okay, So from this you can of course express, you can pick C3 to be something. Pick C3 for example to be 1. Pick it to be 5, I don't care. Pick C3 to be some value. If you take C3 to be 1, then that'll give you C2. Once you know C3 and C2, that'll give you C1. So there are infinitely many solutions. And so that makes this linearly dependent. And you can name a particular solution by, by picking a C3. On the other hand, if you want to show that the other set is linearly is linearly independent, then you're taking C1 times 1, 3, 0 plus C2 times 1, 2, 0 plus C3 times the new one, 1 minus 1, 1 equals 0, 0, 0. And again with the Gauss's method, C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 0. 3C1 plus 2C2 minus C3 equals 0. And then uh, C3 equals 0. Okay. Off you go. Minus 3 row 1 plus row 2. C1 plus C2 plus C3 equals 0. Minus C2 plus minus 4 minus 4 C3 equals 0 and C3 equals 0. And we spot, we have so much experience with these, we spot echelon form right away. There's a unique solution. So you get linear independence. Okay, so, so checking linear independence or dependence is very straightforward. You are going to set up the linear system. Of course, if you can see at a glance what the dependence is, good for you, good for you. But if you don't see at a glance, you set up the linear system, set up the linear system, chug away. Infinitely many solutions implies linear dependence, and you can pick a particular 
for example, C3 equals 7, that will give you C1 and C2, and now you can exhibit a dependence. On the other hand, unique solution gives you linear independence. Okay, what I want to talk about today is the, uh, the relationship between, there we go, whoops, there we go. I want to talk about the relationship between, uh, between sets that are linearly independent and, uh, and the supersets or subsets of those. So uh, let's see here. I want to remind a person what the definition of linear independence is. A uh, set of vectors, of course, is linearly independent if none of its elements is a linear combination of the others, if each element is somehow independent of the others in a linear way. Otherwise, it's linearly dependent. And we did the calculation of linear independence last time as we illustrated it with the check-in. And today, I want to talk about the relationship between, um, between, between subset and superset and linear independence and dependence. So if, uh, if you have a vector space and S is some subset of that space, then you can add vectors to S. You pick a vector v and you throw it into s, making a new set s hat. You pick a vector v, you throw it into s, and the question is, does it make the span grow? Or does it leave the same? So if v is already an element of, uh, of the span, then the new span, the span of s union singleton v, will be the same as the old span. If, on the other hand, V is not an element of span of S, then when you add it to get the new set S hat, then the new span will be bigger than the old span. Okay, so when we, when we first started looking at linear systems, we worried about, we would write like a, a first uh, equation and a second equation, and then we'd say something like, uh, okay, now, if, uh, if the third equation is, for example, the sum of the first two, then it isn't anything genuinely new. And so we would get what we did, what we today call a linear dependence. That is, in the terminology we have today, the third row would be in the span of the first two rows. And so we found that it didn't add anything new to the equations. If, on the other hand, it was something genuinely new, it wasn't a combination of the first two, why then it, it sometimes made, for example, a system have a solution. Now, the, uh, I, I don't want to make this more complicated than it is, so I want to do an illustration rather than a proof. Sometimes the proofs, is a, you can lose the ideas a little bit. So I'm going to take a set, capital P, and the span is the xy plane. I want to make it perfectly clear that the span is the xy plane, so I took a very straightforward example. I can add a vector to get a size 3 set, either P0 or P1. I can add a vector to get a size 3 set, and I can do one of two things. The vector is called Q. I can either add something from the xy plane, or I can add something that isn't from the xy plane, somehow sticks up. If the, if the new vector is from the xy plane in the P0 case, well, then the span of P0 will be the same as the span of P. You haven't added anything new, whatever new means. Well, of course, we're in the process of defining new. But if the vector that you added lies outside the span, then the span will grow. The span of P1 is strictly bigger than the span of P. You can get not just xy plane vectors, but you can also get vectors that have a vertical component. Okay. Okay, so... Um, so the corollary is that if you have a, 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 a V and S in your, in your, what I'm thinking of as a spanning set, if you omit that vector, then emitting that vector does not shrink the span if and only if it's dependent on the other vectors in the set. So if you have a vector that's, that's dependent on the other vectors, you can toss it and it won't change the span. And this is the right example to look at. So, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Have you noticed that 7, 8, 9 is a combination of 1, 2, 3, and 4, 5, 6? Maybe you noticed because it said so down here. If you take 2 times the second vector and subtract the first, 2 times 4 minus 1 does make 7. 2 times 5 minus 2 makes 8. 2 times 6 minus 3, 12 minus 3 does make 9. So 7, 8, 9 is a, is, a, is a combination of the first two vectors, and in some sense it's a repeat of the first two. So the, the span of this set is the same as the span of this set. 
What you can do with a linear combination of vectors from this set is exactly the same as what you can do with a linear combination of vectors from this set. The third vector is a repeat of the information in the first two. Okay, and just turning it now to, to talk about linear independence, a, a set is a linearly independent if and only if for any vector in S, its removal shrinks the span. So, uh, so if I take, for example, since it's here on the screen, I'll use it, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that's linearly independent. If you throw out the 4, 5, 6, no longer do you span a plane, now you only span a line, all the multiples of 1, 2, 3. Here's another example, of course, this is, uh, uh, this is a linearly independent subset of the cubic polynomials, 1 plus x, 1 minus x, and x squared. If you, because it's linearly independent, if you take out any element, for example, if you remove the middle one, to get the new set s hat 1 plus x and, and comma x squared, then that'll make the span smaller. The span of s hat is smaller than the span of s. So there's an interaction between linear independence and span. Again, all these results that are, are, each of them are small results at a time, lemmas and corollaries, but they, uh, they all add up to the intuition about what is new and what is not new. If you're in the span, if you're linearly dependent on the other vectors, then you don't add anything new. Let's suppose S is linearly independent and that V is not in S, then the set S union singleton V is linearly independent if and only if V is not in S. That is to say, if it, not in the span of S. If V is something genuinely new, then when you add it to a linearly independent set, you retain linear independence. But if V is not genuinely new, if V is in the span, then adding it to a linearly independent set will cause the set to be, because the new set, to be linearly dependent. And here's the illustration. So, uh, so this is a linearly independent subset of P2, 1 minus x and 1 plus x. Its span is a set of all linear polynomials, and I, I think that should be clear, but if it isn't clear, here's the check. You can get any linear polynomial as a combination of these two. There are two ways that you could add a vector to S to get either S1 or S2. If you add a linear polynomial while you're adding something that's in the span of S. So S1, it takes S and it adds, a, a, adds something that's already in the span, so something that you could already reach. Whereas S is linearly independent, the set S1 with this repeat information will be linearly dependent. The other thing you can do, of course, is to add a vector that's genuinely new in the sense that it isn't in the span. Where S is linearly independent, so too S2 is linearly independent. This has linears, this has a quadratic, so it's something genuinely new, it isn't in the span. Okay, so the point here is that there's an interaction between span and linear independence that we're working up to. The next section, we talk about the, uh, the, the, the interaction very closely. There's an interaction between span and linear independence, and it all has to do with this idea from first day, second day, of talking about things that are linearly new. Um, so uh, a corollary, another small result in a vector space, a any finite set has a linearly independent set with the same span, and I, I'm going to do this by example, but the basic idea is you just, it's a finite set, so you can throw things out one at a time, and eventually you'll, you'll you know, you'll get down to where, uh, where all that's left is linearly, um, uh, linearly independent. And that's the idea here. So I took, uh, I took a set with many, many vectors in it, and clearly linearly dependent. For example, the second one is three halves the first. If I write down a linear relationship, I get a lot of, of R1s, R2s, and R3s. Do Gauss's method, and you spot that R1 and R3 are leading variables. And the other aren't leading variables. Free variables. When you do the parameterization, there you see the R2, the R4, and the R5 are free variables. Now I want you to notice that if you set R5 to be 1 and R2 and R4 to be 0, set R5 to be 1 and R2 and R4 to be 0, then you get an R1 and an R2. So there's R1, excuse me, R3. There's R3, and there's R5. This is a linear relationship among those three vectors. This is a linear relationship among those three vectors, so it exhibits a linear dependence. 
So S5 in particular is in the span of the set S1, S3. And likewise, if you do the same deal for R4 and you do the same deal for R2, this vector right here will be in the span of the set S1, S3. This vector right here will be in the span, excuse me, uh, uh, the, the vector the vector S4 will be in the span of the set S1, S2, excuse me, I misspoke, and uh, uh, S1, S3, and then uh, the vector S2 will be in the span of the set S1, S3. Excuse me, I misspoke. Okay, so what that tells you is that you can throw those out. You can throw out S5 because it's in the span of S1, S3. You can throw out S4 because it's in the span of S1, S3. You can throw out S2 because it's in the span of S1, S3. A and now you're down to a uh, linearly independent set. A and so the, the, the result is that you can throw out any of, the, uh, any of the other variables and retain only the vectors associated with the leading variables, and that suffices. And a corollary, really it's a restatement of what we just did, but it's uh, sometimes convenient to do it in this order. A subset of a vector space is linearly independent, excuse me, linearly dependent, if and only if some SI is a linear combination of the vectors that come before it. And the, the proof is here, but the basic idea is pretty straightforward. You just add the first, then you add the second, then you add the third. At some point, you get to a dependent set. At that point, the vector you just added must be dependent on the previous ones. That, that's all. So a small observation. Um, uh, so that's that. We're now at the at the conclusion that linear independence and span interact in some way. In particular, a subset of a linearly independent set is is also linearly independent, and a superset of a linearly dependent is also linearly dependent. Just to take the first sentence, if you have a linearly independent set, there is no relationship, no linear relationship, uh, no non-trivial linear relationship among the vectors throw out some of the vectors, there's still no non-trivial linear relationship among the vectors. Likewise, but, but flipped over, we linearly dependent. If you have a linear relationship among some of the vectors, and you add more, the old linear relationship still holds. So that gives you these two corners. If S is independent, and S hat is a subset of S, then S hat must be independent. On the other hand, if S is dependent and S hat is a superset of S, then S hat must be dependent. That's this lemma restated. The other two corners of the box are, are, are can go either way. If S is independent and you add stuff to it to make it bigger, to make it S hat, well, if you add, what, if you add stuff that's already in the span, then you flip from being independent to being dependent. On the other hand, if you add stuff that isn't in the span, then you stay independent. So this could be either. And likewise, this is exactly the same thing. If, if S is dependent, then if you're going to throw stuff out to make a smaller S hat, you can throw out stuff that brings you down to independent, or you can fail to do that. We've seen examples of both of those happening. Okay, so... Um, so so we talked about here the relationship between independence, between linear independence and, um, uh, and subset and superset. And always at the heart of those was that there's some interaction between linear independence and span. The two of them have to do with each other very closely. And we're, we're, going, to, uh, we're going to next time talk about how very closely they are related. Okay, very good. Okay, bye-bye.